worship with us this morning.
Savior, Jesus Christ, is alive. He rose from the dead, and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there. And they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior. Philippians 3 and verse 10, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul writes in his letters to the Ephesian church, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. So all of us collectively, could we just turn our attention towards heaven, turn our attention towards the risen Savior, thank Him for His mercy and grace that Scripture says abounds to us each and every morning. It's new. God, we thank You for forgiving us of our sins, for bearing all of our sin upon yourself, for experiencing the very wrath and punishment of God. But you defeated death. You rose again. And that same power that rose you from 
the grave. The same power that has forgiven sins and has canceled the debt of sin is alive in us. Praise the one who set me free. Death has no longer a grip on my life. But for those who believe, everlasting life. We thank you, God. Because of Christ, we are alive. Amen? Because he lives, we also live. This song, it, it reminds me of that old song by Bill and Gloria Gaither. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Some of us, it's tough to want to wake up the next day and keep going through our various health challenges, through our trials, through the hell that we go through on this earth. But because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. I don't have to fear tomorrow. What does Jesus say? Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. It has enough troubles of its own. Because I know he holds the future, life is worth living because he lives. Life is worth living because he lives. What does scripture also tell us? I came that they may have life, have it to the full, have it abundantly. And so God, we thank you that you live. We thank you that because you live, we do not need to fear tomorrow. We can face tomorrow. And life is worth living because you came to give life. You not only give life, but you are life. You are the very essence and power of life. And you conquered death. So because of Christ, I am alive. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord.
Therefore, God exalted him to the high place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, everything in heaven and on earth and under the earth must bow and submit. Every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the name above every name. Come on, church, let's sing hallelujah. He's the name above. Some of us may know the Apostle Creed, the Nicene Creed. The Creed is a core of beliefs, fundamental truths. Some would argue that the first creed that was ever verbalized is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And Lord is the name that is above every other name. And don't you love that scripture? That one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day this will happen, but we get to do it right now. We get to glorify right now. We get to worship right now. We don't have to wait until the end of the day. We get to do it right now. And so we lift high the name of Jesus. We celebrate his resurrection and his victory over death, hell, and the grave. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Hey, would you be seated? Would you? Say hello to someone around you. Let them know you're happy to see them in church. It's Resurrection Day, baby. Resurrection Sunday! Yes, sir! Resurrection Sunday, one of the greatest days in history. I'm trying to figure out how to make sure my <laughs> iPad doesn't turn off. Hold on, display brightness. No, that's not it. You know what, forget it. We're just going to wing it. Please. Jesus Christ defeated death out on the grave, and he can defeat this iPad in Jesus' name. It's Resurrection Sunday. Welcome to Lifestone Church. My name is Josiah. So thankful that you've decided to spend this day celebrating with us. He is risen. He has risen. Indeed, he is alive. Every year around Easter, I have conversations with my kids about 
why someone would want to kill Jesus. Why did the Roman centurions kill Jesus? Why would Jesus give up his life willingly to save others? And does God have a beard? They want to know. My kids want to know, does God have a beard? They want to know, when is Jesus returning? When is his second coming? When is he going to return again? They think it would be awesome if he returned on his birthday, and what a celebration that would be. Listen, I'm not too concerned about if God has a beard or not. I'm not too concerned about when Jesus returns, because this day is the day of celebration. As Paul writes, I don't want to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. As Paul writes, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and somehow attaining to his resurrection from the dead. Our scripture reading for today is found in the gospel of John chapter 11 and verse 25. It will be on the screen for you as well. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? In John chapter 11, Jesus gets word that his dear friend Lazarus has gotten sick and died. And this is not just an ordinary friend. This is not someone that you might consider your Facebook friend or social media friend that you sort of keep tabs on but actually don't ever interact with in person (laughs) at all. Scripture says uh, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, they write to Jesus and they say, Lazarus, the one you love, is sick and dying. Jesus loves Lazarus. This is a terrible terrible news he's heard. He's heartbroken, grief-stricken. And when Jesus arrives to Bethany, where Mary and Martha are, and where Lazarus has died, he's met with a myriad of responses. He's met with a complex situation. Jesus arrives in Bethany, and people are mourning. People have gathered around Mary and Martha to console them, to mourn together. They were actually professional mourners, people who this was their occupation. They would come around their family to mourn and to cry and to weep. And Martha runs out to meet Jesus on the road. And she says, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, in a moment, is faced with his own grief of his dear friend that he lost. He's faced with all of the mourning, all of the sadness because of sin and death. He's confronted by Martha who runs out, where the heck were you, Jesus, if you would have been here? My brother would not have died. And Jesus responds to her in verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha, she was a good Jew, right? She knew the Old Testament. She knew God of the Old Testament. She knew someday, somehow, she had a vague idea that there would be a resurrection. But Jesus is not saying someday. He's saying no, today. In our key passage, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then we jump to verse 41 at the grave at the tomb of Lazarus. So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I have preached this passage a number of times before. Like twice, okay, I don't know why. I I made it sound like, you know, a number of times. I've preached it maybe like two times before. And every time that I've preached, (laughs) every time that I've preached this message, I have always used Christ's invitation, do you believe that, 
as an energetic and emphatic to incite some sort of response from everybody. Do you believe this? <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. Do you believe this? Yeah, we believe it. Yes, Jesus is Lord. We believe it. However, this year, I want for us to hear Jesus' words not as imposition, not expecting an energetic response, but rather to hear Jesus' words as an invitation. It's an invitation to make a choice. Do you believe? Isn't it interesting that Jesus asked Martha this question? He offers her this invitation before he raises Lazarus from the dead. You see, Jesus doesn't need to perform this miracle to prove that he is God. He is God. He is the resurrection and the life. He does not just give life. He is life. Jesus being equally God is not conditional based on the circumstance. Some of you need to hear that in your own life. Jesus being Equally God, all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient, omnipresent, everywhere at one time is not based on your circumstance. Oh, this is a really difficult situation. I don't know if God hears me. Oh, this is, it's not conditional based on the circumstance. Jesus being equally God is predicated on the fact, it's based on the fact that that is who he is. He's God Almighty. He is I am. In the Greek, he is ego a me. I exist. I exist. Over the last several weeks as a church, we have been studying Jesus' I am statements recorded in the Gospel of John. And every time Jesus makes one of these powerful declarations, he's revealing his divinity. And it presents everyone within the sound of his voice an invitation to make a choice. Do you believe this? Jesus invitation and what we see all throughout these seven I am statements, this choice, reminds me of the writings of C.S. Lewis when he presents a trilemma, a trilemma. Some of you may know that if A equals B, then C, it's a trilemma, three options. C.S. Lewis's trilemma is if Jesus claims to be God, he is either liar, lunatic, or he is Lord. And all throughout our study of these I am statements, we can see the different responses and the different decisions people made to this invitation. So let's just review. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, before Abraham was, I am. The response of the Pharisees in John 8 and verse 13, they challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. They have made the choice that he's a liar. In verse 48, now the Jews answer him, aren't we right in saying that you are Samaritan and demon-possessed? He's claiming to be a lunatic. Verse 51 in John 8, Jesus says something similar to what he said, Martha, in our main text today. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. And their response, at this they exclaim, now we know you are demon-possessed. They have made a choice to believe He is a lunatic. When Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep, I am the good shepherd, in John 10, the response, the Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why are we listening to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. So not quite liar, not quite lunatic, but not quite Lord. It's a superficial belief in Jesus. Yeah, maybe when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, In John 6, at this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They chose to respond with grumbling and confusion. When Jesus said to his disciples, these disciples who have been walking with him for the last several years, these disciples who have seen the very miracle working power of Jesus The very miracle working power of God when Jesus says to his disciples, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Philip responds, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Just show us one more sign that you are I am, that you are ego e me, that you exist, that you are God. Show us one more sign. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? 
even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? When Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, John 16, then Jesus' disciples said, now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe, Jesus replied? The response to Jesus' invitation, his claims to be God, was that they chose to believe he is Lord. And in our selected text for today, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, the response to this invitation, this choice, is both the confession of faith, choosing to believe, and also confusion. In John 11, our main passage in verse 27, Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. The choice she made is to confess that he is Lord. Not a liar, not a lunatic, he is Lord. And then just 10 verses later in verse 37, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Not quite liar, not quite lunatic, but not quite Lord. Verses 45 and 46, therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. These are the I am statements that we have been studying together as a church. Every time Jesus makes one of these I am statements, claiming his divinity, revealing his divinity, it gives everybody an invitation. Do you believe this or not? And in this last reaction, this last decision, the response of Jesus' invitation was that many Jews believed that Jesus was Lord while others believed he was either a liar or lunatic, and they were a little whiny pants, a little tattletale, and went to go tell the Pharisees everything Jesus had done. So you can see the various responses to Jesus' invitation when making these I am statements. Even the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, known as the Sanhedrin, they had had enough of Jesus' invitations. They had had enough of his miracle working power. They had had enough of these claims to be God. And in verse 48 of John 11, let this reveal their intention. They have this meeting, the Sanhedrin, these religious leaders. They say, if we let him go on like this, then everyone will what? Believe. Then everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Everyone will believe. Jesus has the authority over sin and death and hell. He has proven it. Jesus has opened the eyes of the blind. Jesus has made the lame to walk. Jesus has cleansed the lepers. Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus being God is not conditional on circumstance. He is God. He doesn't need to continue proving his divinity or convincing anyone of his divinity. And I can try my best to prove to you and to convince you, but ultimately, today, the choice is yours. You already know the Easter story. You already know at creation, God communed with man, Adam and Eve, in the garden. And then sin entered the world through rebellion and disobedience. And it separated a sinful human nature from a righteous, pure, and holy God known as the fall. Until God came down to this earth in Jesus Christ, full of that purity and righteousness, living a sinless life, taking on the sins of the world, every sin, past, present, and future. And in one moment, Jesus bore all of that on himself and received the wrath and penalty for sin from God so that we wouldn't have to receive that penalty and wrath from God. He traded his righteousness for our sin. He offers us salvation and everlasting life through faith in Jesus Christ. I can try my best to prove to you and to convince you, but ultimately today the choice is yours. 
you have an invitation. You don't need me to talk about how Jesus fulfilled over 330 prophecies written about him hundreds of years before he walked the earth. You don't need me to talk about how the Bible was written by over 40 different authors over a period of approximately 1,400 years. And still there are over 63,000 cross-references. The authors of those Dune novels can't even come close to those cross-references. You know what I'm saying? You don't need me to talk about the 500 witness accounts who saw the resurrected Jesus that the Apostle Paul references in his letter to the Corinthians. This letter to the Corinthians, the Greeks in Corinth, these were extremely educated, skeptical, considered to be the forethought leaders of their day. They were eager to disprove Jesus Christ, the Messiah, risen from the dead. And yet those same Greeks, those same Jews, those same Gentiles could not stop the testimony of the early apostles, of the early church, and the advancement of the early church as it went up and down the country, persecuted by the Roman Empire, a Afraid that they would take our, our temple, afraid that they would take our nation, all the while proclaiming that Jesus was the risen Savior. You don't need me to emphatically pose the popular argument by Christian authors and apologists. Men will die for what they believe to be true, but they will never die for what they know to be a lie. You don't need me to tell you the story of Easter. You don't need me to prove to you that he is the resurrection and the life. You have a choice. You have an invitation. Hear the words of the Lord. Do you believe? Again, in the writings of C.S. Lewis, it's an invitation that Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or he is Lord. We have that trilemma visualized for you in a little bit of a flow chart. You can see it on the screen there. Jesus said, I am God. If it's true, then Jesus is God. He is Lord. If it's false, and he said so with sincerity, then he must be a lunatic. If it's false, and he did so with insincerity, with being an insincere heart, then he's a liar. He can't be trusted. He's a manipulator. This choice, this invitation that Jesus gives to all of us today is the most important decision that we will ever make. He is either God or he is not. We will either choose to believe or we won't. So often we get caught up in our own lives thinking that these little decisions we have to make are the most important. We get so consumed and I'm guilty. What, do, what am I going to spend my money on? Listen, I researched running shoes for like six months <laughs> before I bought a pair. I'm like, listen, if I'm going to drop $100 on a pair of shoes, they better be good shoes. And then I get crippled with hesitation and then I don't make a decision at all. It's so important. It weighs on me day and night. What shoes am I going to buy? How silly. We think the decisions about who we will vote for, about what political party will we get behind, about how outraged we will be at days that are being recognized, instead of acknowledging that he is Lord, that's the most important decision we will ever make. Down to the simplest things, the silliest things, we get consumed by our own trilemmas, by our own choices. You know, some of, some of these trilemmas that we may face, we have a flow chart for you, deciding whether or not to stay at an awkward party. Okay, do I stay at this awkward party? <laughs> no? Okay. Should I stay? <laughs> do they have free food? <laughs> yes. All right, I'm there. <laughs> uh, you got free food? I'm coming to the cookout. <laughs> if you don't got free food, I'm leaving. For all of you DIYers, all of you crafty hands-on people, here's one for you. Does it move? No. Should it? No. No problem. Does it move? No. Should it? Slap some WD-40 on that bad boy. Get that thing going. Does it move? Yes. Should it? No. Duct tape. The most valuable tool in every man's tool chest. 
parents, let me help you out quickly. Playing games with your kids, here's the appropriate way. Start playing the game. Get told what the rules are by your kid. Are you winning? Yes, make a mistake and lose. Are, <laughs> are you winning? No, keep going and lose. It all ends with you losing, <laughs> except for in my house. Where's Jonah at? I'm smacking that boy on Madden, dog. <laughs> he doesn't get to win. Life lessons, life lessons from your pastor. And finally, let me help all the men who are here today who are in any sort of relationship. <laughs> I do something stupid, she gets mad, I apologize. She does something stupid, I get mad, she gets mad, I still apologize. So know that when you came to church on Easter Sunday, not only did I give you parenting advice, relationship advice, but also crafting DIY device and social interaction advice. These are silly, but sometimes social anxieties. Am I being a good parent? I spent all this time crafting and working, and it's still not working. They consume every thought of us. This must be the most important decision I will ever make. But I will tell you, back to our original trilemma, Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or he's Lord. This is the greatest decision you will ever make. And so, should we believe that Jesus is either liar or lunatic? Can we go to the next slide? If Jesus is not God, then you are God. You've placed yourself at center. You're the Lord of your own life. And if that's the case, our understanding is that humans are finite being. And so you will be final. There will be an end. Eternal darkness. If you are God and he is not and you are the Lord of your life, you will live for self. You will die for self. Have you ever made I am statements like I am the bread of life? I am eternal life. I am the way, the truth, the life. Have you ever made these statements? No. We place ourselves at center. Mike shared a few weeks ago in his message, if this is the case, if this is the decision that we've made, then we might as well become hedonists, just searching for every type of pleasure, just enjoying life. But consider today, if he is Lord, Jesus says, I am God, and if it's true, then Jesus is God. He is Lord. That means every claim he ever made about himself is true. And if that's true, then it demands my entire heart. It demands my entire soul. It demands all of me. If Jesus is God, if he is Lord, then he is Lord over all creation. And he is the Lord of my life. We don't often contemplate the end. We don't often discuss matters of existence until something shakes us. Tragedy, crisis, heartache, the passing of a loved one. Things that are beyond our human comprehension. As humans, we want to control everything. We want to control the narrative. We want to handle our own outcomes. We want to be the owners of our own destiny. We want to have all the understanding and wisdom. Because if there's an unknown, then we can't control it and we play God. But if Jesus is who he says he is, not only is he Lord over all creation, then he must be the Lord of my life. I spent a majority of our time together today setting up this decision, this choice. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how powerfully I speak, how sincere my intentions, how funny or how silly these illustrations, the decision is yours. Again, to use the words of the Apostle Paul when writing to these highly educated and critical Greeks in Corinth, he says, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or with human wisdom, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Paul, again, writing to these same Greeks in chapter 15. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. We're going to prepare to close and end. Why is this important? Why is this the most important decision I will ever make? Why is the resurrection important? Why does John include Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead in his powerful statement that I am the resurrection and the life? Well, Jesus tells us plainly his purpose. The beginning of John 11, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. When Lazarus is resurrected, we don't get a 60-minute interview or Dateline NBC documentary with Lazarus about his four days that he spent in the tomb. What was it like? What was the afterlife like? Trying to gain more knowledge, right? We want to control. We want to know. We want to be all-knowing, all-powerful. But the purpose is that God is glorified through Jesus so that many would choose to believe that Jesus is God and have everlasting life. Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ important? Because it proves that God has the power to not only raise the dead, but to defeat death entirely. That Jesus does more than give life, he is life, and death has no power over him or any of us who are in Christ Jesus. No matter how dead in sin, no matter how dead in addiction, No matter how caught up and dead in torment and torture of the trials and experiences of this world, we know that Jesus has already overcome the world, and so we can have a hope as an anchor for my soul. Because he lives, I don't fear tomorrow. Because he lives, life is worth living. Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ important? It's important for believers and non-believers alike. Listen to me. Those who have made the decision to believe Jesus is God and those who have yet to, we are all the same. Because if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, then we have no choice but to completely surrender our entire lives to him. Not believing in Jesus nominally or superficially or when it works best for us, but every single day day, laying our life down, surrendering our life down, yielding our life down for Him. Are you here today and are you tired of playing God? Are you tired of trying to control your own destiny? Are you tired of putting yourself at center? Well, we can believe in God, we can believe in the power of God, and we can still not make Him the Lord of our life. We struggle to serve ourselves and serve God simultaneously. And Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two lords. Either he is Lord, or you are the Lord of your own life. Do you believe this? The invitation is for you to believe and decide this day whom you will serve. And should you make this decision... I want to let you know that next week we have an opportunity to be baptized, demonstrated in Scripture. We see that baptism always follows a confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've made that decision. Maybe you've accepted this invitation to believe that Jesus is Lord over all creation and the Lord of your life. But you've fallen away. You've drifted away. And today you want to recommit your life to Jesus. And next week you want to get baptized. If you want to do that, you can scan the QR code in front of you. Just simply click, yes, I believe. You can go onto our website, click the events tab, sign up and register for baptisms. Do you believe this? The invitation for you to believe and decide this day whom you will serve starting in two weeks. We are providing a four-week opportunity to learn what it means to follow Jesus. It's a new believers class. 
Maybe you want to learn what it truly means to follow Jesus. Maybe you need to unlearn things that you've been taught about what it means to follow Jesus. A lot of times that looks like Jesus and this. Jesus and Jesus plus this. Jesus plus this. But today is your invitation. Do you believe? I have a tendency to circle talk. So I certainly don't want to belabor this point. But you know the Easter story, and if you didn't, I quickly went over it. You don't need me to prove to you that Jesus resurrected from the dead, even though I spent some time doing that. The choice is yours. And isn't this just like a loving God? That he gives you that choice. I can believe him. I can have everlasting life. I don't have to fear death because he's given me that choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. But as it is written in the Old Testament, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your wonderful invitation to believe. Jesus, we thank you that you were never imposing or pushing yourself, your divinity on others, but what you were doing was inviting and persuading because of your great love. You are not a God that demands our belief in you. You give us a choice because you're loving and kind. And so today, for those of us who would make that choice to believe that you are Lord, I just pray right now with, for everyone within the sound of my voice, in person, online, wherever you are, you would make the decision today to say Jesus is Lord of my life. You've made a confession of faith in Jesus Christ, believe he is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead. You are being made into a new creation today. Scripture says that the Holy Spirit, in this moment, should you make that decision, is living and active on the inside of you. That the Holy Spirit, who is also co-equally God, is like a seal on your life, guaranteeing your inheritance in heaven, guaranteeing your everlasting life. God, we thank you for life. We thank you for life everlasting that's offered through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for everlasting life that's offered through faith and not by works because our works will never measure up. But it's through grace and faith. And so if you're here today, would you just receive the forgiveness of your sins? I'm not gonna have you repeat after me, but there's a, a common sinner's prayer that would just say, God, I'm a sinner. I've tried to work. I've been the Lord of my own life. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sin. I'm making the decision today to make you the Lord of my life. I don't know what it means to completely surrender my life to you every single day, God. Show me. Walk with me. Send your Holy Spirit, the advocate, to lead and guide me. Surround me with a church community. Give me opportunities to be baptized and to learn more about you. But today, Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we close today, if you're willing and able, let's stand to our feet and let us just as a sign of confession, a song of confession, let's sing this song.
I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. Let's sing. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in Come on, sing this. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Oh, I believe. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. I believe in God our Father. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the resurrection. Amen. Come on, last time. For I believe in the name of Amen, church. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Jesus is Lord. And this brings glory to God the Father. Again, thank you so much for celebrating Easter Sunday with us. As I mentioned, next week we are celebrating baptisms in both service, 915 and 1115. If you are, all right, Mr. Bland. If you are interested in getting baptized, you can certainly sign up for it on our website or you can scan the QR code in front of you. The following weekend, Saturday the 13th, we are having a women's event with a guest speaker, Melody Leak, Pastor Jeff, who is our spiritual oversight. His wife is coming to speak and spend time with all of the women in the house, so we invite you to be there for that. And then the next day, Sunday, we are beginning a four-week following Jesus class. What does it mean to follow Jesus? This will be held during our 1115 service, so you can come to the 915 at 10 service and then go to the 1115 class. You can register for those things on our website as well. If you are interested on take, in taking Jesus is Lord, overseas we have an opportunity to go on a mission trip with sos and our very own board of stewardship member steve bland so if you're interested if god has ever spoken to you about doing missions work overseas and just proclaiming the gospel and seeing the very power of jesus on display you can certainly email the church you can email steve bland you can talk to Steve Bland. He's wearing all red, so you can't miss him. And we will get you more information. The window for this is very sh limited. It's very short. So if you are interested, don't hesitate. Don't wait. If God's moving on your heart to do so, then do so. And lastly, before we leave, we're going to move into our time of giving. If you're a guest with us today, please feel no obligation to give. This time is just for those who call Lifestone Church their home church and believe in what God is doing here. I will let you all know that our LSC groups got together 
to raise money to buy us a new baptismal tank. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and we have one. <laughs> this will be the very baptismal tank that we use next week. And so thank you all so much for your continued giving. Do you see how your continued giving, your faithful giving, is going to advance the kingdom of God, even through baptism? So thank you so very much. There are four ways to give. Uh, they're on the screen. There's a box over there. There's a kiosk out in the lobby. Uh, but thank you so much again for your giving. You're truly making a difference in advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have an awesome Easter Sunday. Please hang around. We've got all kind of stuff from Oakmont Bakery. Uh, we've got yogurt and bananas and fruit. The heaters are on outside. So flee, feel no rush to get out. Spend some time with your ch church family. Wait for those who are showing up to the 1115. And just hang out and let's be the church together. Amen. All right. Be blessed. Have an awesome Easter Sunday.